third-party libraries in applications. Eric? Thank you for the introduction, Will. So my name is Eric Dare. I'm a PhD student at CISPA. And today I'm going to talk about joint work on reliable third-party library detection on Android and which new security analysis this approach enables. So let me start with the question on why do we need to detect libraries on apps? So in the last years, a couple of approaches have been proposed that studied various security aspects of applications, such as privacy leaks, uh, proper, uh, improper usage of SSL, TLS, or even misuse of crypto API, to just name a few. And while all these approaches provided uh, very useful insights and discovered new security issues, they mainly treated the app as a single entity. Uh, also, prior research also has shown that uh, third-party libraries are a contributing factor to such security issues. So the question, who is to blame if such a security vulnerability is found, uh, mostly remained unanswered. Results such as uh, this app includes 10 privacy leaks are certainly useful, but they would uh, be even more useful if they could tell us this, li uh, this app contains 10 privacy leaks, but they all come from a single library or a subset of libraries. And treating an application as a single entity could also lead to over-approximated results. When, for instance, 20% uh, of all applications that you are testing leak private data, but uh, all those privacy leaks just come from a single source. So in this case, we need to be able to detect libraries uh, from um, application binaries to give a more accurate per entity statement in, uh, for such approaches. Uh, but before talking about the actual detection of libraries, let me briefly tell you how libraries are integrated into applications. So for the app developer, integrating a library is quite simple. In a developer IDE, he has to explicitly declare which library and which library version to be included for his application. But in the process of generating the final application, this explicit mapping gets lost when third-party library code and application code is compiled to a monolithic bytecode file. And this frequently involves uh, as well bytecode obfuscation techniques such as identifier renaming, which uh, identifiers like class names, package names, uh, uh, were transformed into short, but, uh, short and non-meaningful identifiers. And then you often have that code elimination, which prunes unused parts of the library from your final application. And if the app developer really wants to uh, protect his code, he can also resort to more advanced code-based obfuscation techniques, such as control flow randomization or reflection-based API hiding. So we now uh, know how to integrate libraries, so what is the current status quo in detecting libraries? So there are a couple of related approaches available, but they mainly work on large-scale code clustering. So the idea is that you, have, uh, that you have a certain set of applications, and whenever these applications share some code parts or code fragments, then the assumption is that uh, these code parts are likely to be library code because app developers typically don't share their code. And the main advantage of these approaches is that they can deal with previously unknown, libra uh, yeah, previously unknown libraries. So uh, you do not, uh, they do not require to have any prior knowledge. And that's especially useful when you think of hundreds of different libraries available for uh, application developers. But these approaches also come with some inherent drawbacks. So, for instance, uh, they only give you a very limited precision. They can at most tell you which library is included in the application, but they can't tell you the exact library version. Moreover, these approaches have more or less problems with um, 
advanced code-based obfuscation techniques, and also with dead code elimination, in which only subsets of the original library is included in the application. Uh, okay. So another interesting question besides attributing security vulnerabilities to, to the correct entity is, does something like library version fragmentation exist on the Android ecosystem? So maybe some of you heard about the problem of Android version fragmentation. So there are a lot of different Android versions available and installed on different devices, and they all come with different uh, feature sets and different levels of security patches. And this constitutes a huge problem of the Android ecosystem. Now imagine that there are hundreds of different libraries available with even more library versions. And on average, every 77 days, a new library version comes out, which implies that you have a huge pool of different libraries and library versions available as an application developer. And as for any kind of software, libraries also contain bugs and sometimes even secure or severe security vulnerabilities. And if this happens, you want to know if those vulnerable SDKs are used in the wild. And if a patched version comes out, you want to know if app developers adopt these patched libraries. And if they do, how long does it take? So this all boils down that you know how to detect libraries, including the library versions. So you need to provide this explicit mapping that the application developer had from the very beginning to answer those questions. And unfortunately, the current status quo cannot provide us such a mapping because they haven't seen the original library SDKs in advance. And that's exactly where our approach LibScout comes in. So we want to provide a reliable detection of third party libraries, uh, including a high precision down to pinpointing the exact library version. And we also want to have some measure on to which extent a certain library is included in the application. And finally, we want to be robust not only against common obfusca uh, obfuscation techniques like identifier renaming, but also against more code based, uh, more advanced code based obfuscation techniques. And on a high level, our approach LibScout works as follows. So first, we require to have a library database. And that's the main difference to all of the other approaches. Because uh, we think that there is no way of achieving the aforementioned properties without having seen the original libraries at least once. We then provide a library fingerprinting approach to extract uh, obfuscation resilient profiles from the libraries. We also apply the same technique to the applications that we want to test. And finally, we provide a matching algorithm that tells us which library version is included and to which extent it is included. And in the following, I'll tell you uh, about the individual steps of our approach in a bit more detail. So the first interesting question is, how do we build a library database? And the first question that comes to mind is, what are the distribution channels for Android and Java libraries? So there are a couple of them available. So uh, first, uh, a library provider could host it at, your, at his own website, either an open access, so you can just go to the website download it, uh, and download the SDK, or even with some restricted access, which is often true for analytics and advertisement libraries, uh, for which you have to pre-register with the service first. You have to create an account before you get access to the final SDK. You can also host your library uh, on GitHub, even as a, uh, uh, as a binary or um, with the source code. And finally, you can write, uh, provide your library in a private Maven repository, or you provide it via Maven Central. And then we checked the search engine of, of our choice to um, search for popular libraries, for recommended libraries, for certain functionality. And in the end, we could build a database of about 164 distinct libraries with a bit more than 2,000 versions. 
which makes on average certain versions per library. And there are also exceptional cases that have almost 100 versions available. And by analyzing release logs, change logs, and also using the Mayon Central API to retrieve metadata, we were able to uh, recover the release dates of those libraries in almost all cases. So now that we know how to build the library database, um, the next question is how do we create the actual profiles? And as a design decision, uh, we said that we don't want to use the bytecode at all. And this gives us immediate robustness against any code-based obfuscation technique. But it leaves uh, class hierarchy information only for building the profiles. So on the right, you see a partially unobfuscated package tree of some application. So you see the package relationships, packages, sub-packages, uh, the number of classes per package and brackets. And all this information, along with the message signatures, are used to generate the actual profile. In the end, you could say that we are profiling the private and the public API of the library. And for the actual data structure that we uh, use for our profile, we use a Merkle tree, which is basically a hash tree where all the parent hashes are generated from their child hash, uh, hashes. And typically, they are used for efficient uh, uh, integrity checks for large data structures. But in our case, we could use it for efficient checks whether parts of the library are included or not. Moreover, we fix the depths of the tree to three, so we have a dedicated layer for methods, classes, and one layer for packages, which means that we flatten the package uh, layer um, as compared to the package tree that we have seen before, where you have a package and possibly multiple sub-packages. And the only thing which we now have to fix is how do we start, so how do we generate the method hash? And for the method hash, uh, we use so-called message signatures. And the signature uniquely identifies a method within a code base. And here you can see uh, such an example of a signature with the package name, class method name, followed by um, the list of um, argument types, and finally followed by the return type. And as we want to be robust against identifier renaming, we first have to transform the message signature a bit. So in the first step, we uh, remove anything before the argument type list because this can be renamed. And in the final step, we also replace all non-primitive, non-API types with some placeholder value x. And we finally retrieve what we call a fuzzy descriptor. So you can think about this as a pattern or a template. That's actually the piece of data that we are going to use to, um, uh, to create the method hash. And the only thing which we then have to fix is the build order. So to retrieve a deterministic build order, we first sort all child hashes alphabetically before we actually generate uh, the parent hash. So now that we know how to generate the profiles, we now have to know uh, or we have to check how we match library and application profiles. In the simplest case, we can check if all the library package hashes are included in the application profile. In this case, we know that the complete exact library is included in the application. If this is not the case, we compute a similarity value between zero and one between the profiles, where a value of about uh, 0.8 means that 80% of the original library is included in the application. And in a nutshell, the computation of this value works as follows. So given a library package LP and application package AP, we compute a score not on the package layer, but one layer deeper on the class layer. So we take the number of classes in the library package that also match uh, in the application package, and we put this into relation to the total number of classes in the library package. What we get is a class score between those two uh, library packages. We then uh, repeat this for uh, each library package to create a candidate list of possible uh, application candidates. And finally, we compute the maximum value 
taking into account additional information about the package tree to filter invalid cases. So for instance, if we have the library package LP1 and LP3, uh, which share a package sub package relationship, we require that their candidates, application one and application six, also share the same package relationship. Otherwise, they are filtered out uh, as an invalid case. Okay, so now uh, that we know how the approach works, the first question is how uh, unique are our profiles? So, how good are we in distinguishing different library versions? And we can simply check this by comparing the root hashes for all versions of a specific library. And then we did this for our library database and found out that 60% of all library profiles are unique, which in turn means that about 40% of the profiles are ambiguous. But ambiguous versions only occurred in clusters of consecutive versions. And the average cluster size was between two and three, which means that in those cases, we cannot exactly pinpoint the, uh, the version, but from a set of possibly 20, 30, or even more versions, we can reduce the candidate list on average to two or three uh, items. And the root causes for such ambiguity is that those minor versions only contain bug fixes or code-only changes which were not covered by our profiles. And the next question is, if we now want to, um, or we now want to um, apply LibScout to real apps, so we first have to uh, generate an application repository. And similar to the library uh, database, uh, we do not only download the top apps from Google Play, but for 3,600 apps, we collected the full version history, which is about 100,000 apps or 27 apps per, uh, versions per app. And we additionally downloaded metadata like the release date, which allowed us to compute the average app release interval, which is uh, for the entire data set about 62 days. But if we only take into account uh, data starting from 2015 or the data from this year, uh, the value dropped to 38 days or even uh, slightly below one month. And to compare this to the average library release interval, we see an average of 117 days and 77 days if we only take into account the numbers of 2016. And also the numbers are, the absolute numbers are more than twice as high as for the application release interval. You can see that they follow the same trend. So having more frequent releases. So now we want to know what are the most popular libraries that are used by application developers. And unsurprisingly, eight out of the top 10 libraries were either Android support libraries or Google Play. Uh, Google Play service libraries. So therefore, we filtered them out and created another list. And here you can see that Facebook is the top library in our list, followed by uh, different utility analytics libraries and also advertisement libraries. And if you only take into account the most recent uh, version of each app, you could find that about 70% of the included libraries are outdated, but not only by a single version, oftentimes by two, three, or even more versions. And um, the surprising fact is that if app developers update their library version, they typically need almost one year to do so. OK, so now we take a bit closer look into the, the version fragmentation of the two top lips, so the Android support lip and the Facebook lip. So here you can see um, the very outdated library versions of the Facebook SDK on top and the more current versions at the bottom. As you can see, and by the way, uh, these are only the results for um, complete accurate uh, matches, so we did not include results for partial matching here. So this is a lower threshold what, uh, what we see here, but still you can see that almost any version available is somehow used by any of the top apps. 
We now draw a line starting from 2015, which is about one and a half year ago. You can see that still a significant amount of uh, apps uh, have a very outdated library included. If we now take a look uh, uh, to the distribution of the Android support library, you can see that there is a small trend towards newer versions. But again, if we draw the line, you can see that there is a non-negligible uh, non amount of applications that have a really outdated library version. But you can see on the long tail, there are less outliers. And of course, now an interesting open question is, uh, where do these differences come from? And I will uh, give you a bit more detail at the end of the talk. Okay, so now we have seen uh, how library versions are fragmented, uh, which means that we also can uh, very accurately pinpoint an exact library version. And this also allows us to scan apps for vulnerable libraries. And as a showcase, I picked the Facebook uh, library in version 315. And in the paper, we also have another use case. Uh, this version was released in June 2014. And it included an account hijacking vulnerability through a leaked access token. And there was a vulnerability window of about one month before Facebook released uh, the patched version. Now, our app repository found about 51 distinct vulner uh, vulnerable applications with 400 application versions. If we now have a look at the timeline, uh, we see the timeline on the x-axis and the number of released packages per day on the y-axis. And the arrows mark uh, the time point of the vulnerable SDK on the left and the patched SDK on the right. And as it is normal between those two time points, applications were released with the vulnerable SDK. But more surprisingly, after the patched SDK came out, there was a really high number of applications that were released with the vulnerable SDK. And this was not just for a few months. You can see that even in 2016, new apps were released or re-released with the vulnerable SDK included. Also, in the meantime, more than 25 new Facebook library versions came out. And uh, also surprisingly, if we check the fix rate, uh, there are only a small number of, um, of applications that fixed this problem either by updating to one of that many uh, non-vulnerable versions or by removing the Facebook SDK completely from the app. Okay, so finally, I want to tell you how to extend prior research to um, go from uh, uh, per app statement to a per entity statement. And for that, we chose um, the CryptoLint approach, which was, by the way, one of the few approaches that at that time recognized the problem of libraries and they used package blacklisting to resort uh, or to handle at least the simplest cases. So what we did is we re-implemented the CryptoLint uh, app security checks which uh, tested whether application developers um, correctly used Android's default crypto API. And these six security checks included tests uh, whether the insecure ECB mode were used for encryptions or whether constant initialization vectors or symmetric keys were used. We then applied our analysis to 39 advertisement libraries and 315 versions. And we could find out that 10 of these libraries uh, at least violated one of the six rules. And in total, uh, we had 18 violations. And we could also show that almost all the violations affected the latest version of the library at that time. We then used LibScout to scan our application repository for those vulnerable library versions. And we found 300 distinct uh, applications that, if, uh, that were affected by at least one of those libraries with a cumulative install base of about 3.7 billion users according to Google Play. So in the end, uh, we could show that we can uh, extend prior research 
and attribute security vulnerabilities to the correct entity. As a nice side effect, we can also reduce um, the analysis time for more heavyweight static analysis by pre-processing libraries uh, and then finally identifying the libraries uh, in the application. And as you can see in the numbers that uh, the average library is uh, quite huge. So the average library contains more than 300 classes and 1,700 methods. And by now, we found out that the average application contains more than 13 libraries. So by pre-processing those libraries, we can remove a huge portion of the application code from more heavyweight static analysis. Okay, so to conclude my talk, I wanna first give some takeaways. So we found out that app developers slowly adapt new library versions, if they do at all. And we could also show that similar to the Android version fragmentation problem, uh, the library version fragmentation problem is real and then exists on Android. And while we could uh, answer a lot of new and interesting research questions, at the same time, new questions come out, uh, came out. So for instance, uh, if you remember the library version fragmentation diagram, um, the question is, what are the root causes for not updating libraries? So it could be that um, app developers are lazy, never change a running system. It could be that the public API of the library changes too frequently or that it's too much effort to update to a newer version. So these are all questions that we are currently uh, trying to answer by uh, also um, uh, reaching out to application developers. Uh, but there is uh, still a lot to do in this area. And on the long term, um, the question is if static library linking is the future for Android applications, or if it might be better to go to some dynamic linking like we have it on Linux systems. And finally, um, we are going to open source LibScout um, within the next one or two weeks, most probably after November the 11th. And um, yeah, we would also like to welcome you to contribute to our library database because the more uh, library profiles we have in the database, the more accurate and complete our approach will be. Okay, with that, thank you for your attention. Questions and please uh, state your name. Hi, um, my name is Peter Zankov. Um, I have a, I noticed a lot of similarities. Uh, you, we try to solve a similar problem. I didn't actually talk about some things. We also have similar features that captured also the class hierarchy, the types of methods. So in that sense, it would be interesting to chat about this later. Well, I was wondering, you try to make your approach resilient to different obfuscation mechanisms. So do you have a breakdown idea of uh, what is the breakdown of different obfuscations used in Android and how resilient your method is in terms of layout obfuscation? Uh, to give concrete numbers, that's pretty difficult if you don't have the ground rules in form of uh, the, the source code. But as you said, um, um, identifier renaming is by far the most prevalent type of uh, obfuscation. And now the Android uh, developer IDE now has a feature called Minify which uh, simply um, applies identifier renaming and that code elimination just to shrink uh, the size of the final APK. So many developers will, um, will apply this without knowing that 